my name's James, uh, this is We Love Based Edmonds, and I have with me today uh, Dr. Francis Young, who is an expert on Edmund, uh, our St. Edmund. How did you get into Edmund? What is, what is this so interesting about Edmund? Like, I don't know. <laughs> well, I've always been very interested in the history of the town, um, and I suppose that it's inevitable that if the history of Bury is your thing, you're going to start getting interested in Edmund. But what particularly interested me, the kind of the big unanswered question that nobody had quite satisfactorily dealt with, where is Edmund? What happened to his mortal remains? What happened to his body? And um, it was actually an encounter that I had with a, a, a modern day monk um, back in 2007. And he is the abbot of a, a, a monastery that's dedicated to St. Edmund, which is, if you like, a symbolic successor of the abbey in Bury St. Edmunds, although the modern abbey is, is near Reading. And I asked him, you know, just out of interest, well, what, what do you think of this question? Where do you think Edmund might be? And he mentioned to me that there was a, a document in the archive of his abbey, and that document contained a story about uh, someone who had a, a grandfather or great-grandfather who'd been involved in, in, in hiding the body of Edmund. And that's as recent as that? Um, yeah, so this, wow. is, this is something which took place uh, at, the dissolution of the, at the dissolution of the Abbey. But that sort of then went out of my mind for a few years until in 2013 this article appears in the Bury Free Press, I think it was, in which Sarah Friswell, who then uh, worked for the cathedral, said that there was a tradition among guides that the, uh, the body of St Edmund might be under the, the, the tennis courts. Well, initially I thought, well, you know, why the tennis courts? This yeah. doesn't make a, a, a great deal of sense. It does sound a bit random. Um, it does sound a bit random. But I thought, well, let's investigate this. So I went to the, the abbey uh, that I mentioned near Reading, and I dug out this document that nobody really had properly studied before, and I found in it this, this remarkable story. So I went to the abbey and found this document, which no one had really ever looked at properly before, and it tells a remarkable story where you've got a, a, a tale told by one of the monks in the late 17th century that his great-grandfather had been one of the Berry monks. And of course, after the dissolution, many of the monks went off and married and had children, right. because they were no longer monks. And he claims that his great-grandfather uh, buried the body of St. Edmund, along with a group of other monks, put it in an iron chest and hid it somewhere in the monastery. That's quite key, isn't it? It's key because it's the first evidence that had ever come to light, the first evidence of any kind of what happened to the body of St. Edmund. Now, admittedly, it's quite a few years after these events mm -hmm. took place. It's told as a family tradition. But essentially, until that point, we had no evidence whatsoever. So it's that um, link um, that I think suddenly became important. But the frustrating thing about that document, it doesn't say where in the monastery the body was buried. So then I went back to this tennis court suggestion. And of course, when you look at old plans of the monastery, you can see that the tennis court is on the site of the monastic cemetery. And in fact, the tennis court area, because the tennis courts are on it, is one of the few areas in the abbey that's never been excavated or investigated. And there are good reasons to think that the monastic cemetery, because it was a private, secluded area, would have been a good place to hide the body. Um, so essentially, the, the, the basis on which I'm suggesting that the body of St. Edmund might be in the cemetery is circumstantial. You know, we don't have any direct evidence that it's in that particular place. But at the same time, the rest of the abbey has been searched in particular, the crypt area underneath, directly underneath where the shrine was located, uh, and nothing was found. And M. R. James thought that was the most likely place where the body was yeah. buried. Um, so yeah, uh, I think it's one of the most likely places, and it's certainly worth a look. But I also think that there are good reasons to think that we could identify the body of St. Edmund if we found it. And as, as we learned in the case of Richard III, actually having the evidence that will allow you to make the identification of the body is key. Mm -hmm. um, and the evidence that we have in the case of Edmund is not DNA evidence, we don't have any DNA for Edmund, but we do have certain documents that tell us what the um, 
objects surrounding the burial would be. First of all, we know that it was buried in a, an iron chest. Well, the iron chest may well have rusted, but of course iron oxide leaves a chemical signature in the ground. We also know from Jocelyn de the medieval chronicler of the Abbey, mm -hmm. that inside the coffin of St Edmund, there were a number of items hidden, foremost amongst them a golden angel, and of course gold will not decay in the ground. So, I think it's highly likely that when the body was removed from the shrine, it was still in its coffin, because we have no documentary evidence from the inventory, the list of items that were stolen from the shrine. We don't have that golden angel listed right. among them, so therefore that strongly suggests the coffin was not opened. The coffin, therefore, I think was placed directly into that iron chest and buried, which means if those objects are there, then we can identify, be identify. beyond doubt that this is the body venerated as that of St Edmund in the shrine. Now, now you mentioned Richard III there, because obviously he was found in a car park, as you do. Um, that was very significant that there, she found his body. How, in comparison, how, how important is this in comparison to the Richard III case? If we were to find Edmund in, the, in those tennis courts, how important is that to, to whatever? It, it's an event which, if it happened, and I'm not saying that it will, but if it happened, it would be more important than the discovery of the Why? body of Richard III. And Why? that's because Edmund was the patron saint of England. Um, some would say still is the patron saint of England, but he certainly was the patron saint between the late 11th century and the 14th century, when St George kind of starts to, to, to take his place. Um, so he is a figure who not only you know, is he of great historical importance, but he has this symbolic significance that he takes on after his death as one of the great royal saints and as the embodiment of Englishness. And I, th I think it would be a, a moment when we would have a chance to reflect on our, our, on our national identity and you know, what Edmund means to us, what this discovery means. So I think, yeah, so where is Richard III? clearly a you know, hugely important historical figure as the last Plantagenet king, he is eclipsed in significance by Edmund, even though many people may not even have heard sure. of Edmund outside of Suffolk. There's, there's some schools of thought that say that um, Edmund was, the, was the, the one king who effectively uh, brought England together. Yeah. Would, that be, would that be a reasonable thing to say? Yes, not during his lifetime, but after his death. Essentially what Edmund does is he, he's a, a, a figure who the Anglo-Saxons and the Norsemen who've come in to you know, invade but later settle, he's the figure that these guys have got in common. And so he forms the focus of this common Anglo-Danish identity. You know, for, for quite some time in the later Anglo-Saxon period, England is ruled by a, a Danish king, you know, Canute the Great. And Canute, in fact, was the founder of the Abbey of Paris and Edmund. Indeed, yes. And we've got the anniversary, the millennium of Come, that, coming up in 2020. 2020. Yeah. So that sense in which I think people in East Anglia are perhaps more aware than other parts of the country that there is that Danish, that Viking heritage that we have, as well as the Anglo-Saxon heritage. And then when the Normans come, you'd think that what the Normans would do is, you know, get rid of any trace mm -hmm. of this great English saint, this patron saint of England, because they are, after all, you know, conquerors who want to, you know, put the English down. But instead what they do is they actually decide to co-opt that saint as their own. And we have the building of the magnificent church in Bury, whose massive ruins we can still see today. So uh, actually what Edmund has become, he has become the way in which the different people, the, the, the Danes, the Normans, the Plantagenets, these different people who've ruled over us, how they have actually um, legitimated themselves as English. As you know, he, Edmund is the way that you identify yourself as, as English. You know, right. He was the symbol of English identity. Do you think this is another reason why uh, it's beca he became so popular throughout Europe? Even as far as, I believe, Iceland? I yes, that's right. Well, Edmund uh, was very popular amongst the people who killed him. You know, very popular amongst <laughs> the, the Norwegians, the Danes, the Icelanders. And yeah, I, I think it's because um, Edmund, he's, he, 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 he can function in a multitude of different ways. You know, he's, he's a symbol of Englishness, but he's also a symbol of resistance to the Vikings. And of course, the Vikings attacked lots of places around Europe, not just England. And he also becomes a kind of symbol, a mascot, if you like, 
for the, the Danes themselves because they associate themselves with the killing of Edmund, which, although they were pagans at the time, mm. ironically they contributed to Christianity by making this martyr. Um, so, um, I mean, my current uh, focus of research, I'm working on my second book about Edmund, mm -hmm. which is about the cult of St. Edmund in Ireland. And one of the reasons why Edmund may have been popular in Ireland is because, of course, Ireland, like England, suffers from the Vikings, you know, is, is attacked by the Vikings. Um, so it's curious that, you know, in, a, in a, a country that doesn't necessarily have any real connection to the Anglo-Saxons or, or to East Anglia, nevertheless, the cult of St. Edmund becomes popular in Ireland, in Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and even further afield. So we've got the spread of the cult in France, in Italy, and the furthest afield that it ever travelled was to Egypt. Wow. Um, this, so yeah, this it's, is it's a, truly this a global cult. Is, absolutely. This is the word, using the word cult in the more mi middle-aged type. Uh, type of, yeah, type of yeah, yeah, that's right. So cult, cult, when it's referred to in, in, in the sense of a saint, it doesn't mean a kind of sinister religious group. It means more um, the uh, the culture of veneration of that saint, which would include pilgrimages to the shrine. It would include the writing of lives of St Edmund, you know, the creation of illuminated manuscripts by the monks of Bury. Basically, any honour that is shown to the memory of that person. But it's just a shorthand way of talking about that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for chatting to me today. Hopefully that's given you quite a bit of insight into why Edmund is so very, very important and why we are constantly banging on about it all the time saying, you know, listen to what your, what your, what your, your body and your, your heart feels because that's very, very important to the whole area of St Edmundsbury, West Suffolk and further afield as well. Thank you. Thank you, Francis Young. Thank you very much.